So hello and welcome back yet again to recapping uh, another couple of chapters from book two of the Enduring Flame trilogy by Mercedes Lackey and James Mallory. Book two is titled The Phoenix Endangered and it's, it's definitely the ramping up book. You know, book one was getting to know our characters, you know, getting to see them as they're beginning their journey. Book two is definitely, things are ramping up. We're bringing all the threads together for book three, which will hopefully be a satisfying conclusion. In the last chapters that we recapped, um, we learned a little bit more about the Isvani army and why exactly they they turned into an army and decided to start rampaging around and destroying all of the Atreyu cities. Atreyu, reminding everyone, just means well, and it's the, the cities that are around the edge of the Mandirian Desert, which are considered quite hospitable because they all have permanent wells at the center of them. And what turned the Isvani tribes into an army was finding the bodies of wild mages. And the, the Isvani correctly determined that nothing but magic could have slain their wild mages because obviously they're they're also magic users, and only magic can destroy magic. So they incorrectly decided that it must have been the city dweller's fault and that they should go and destroy all of the cities to take revenge for killing the wild mages, never knowing that the person who killed all of their wild mages was the person who had gathered them all together. So Biso Chim definitely caused his own problems. Unfortunately, these problems are problems that Harrier and Tercel are going to have to deal with because they are in one of the Atreyu cities and they heard that the Isvani army was coming. The city slowly was preparing for it, thinking that they would be able to have plenty of time until the army showed up only the army showed up in the middle of the night and Harrier and Tercel rode out because Tercel wanted to talk with the army and see if maybe he could just logic them out of the way. That didn't work. I mean, we're talking about zealots here. And at the very end, Tercel cast Maid Shield around the entire city, which is great. It's going to keep the Isvani from coming in and attacking it's also not great because Tercel has to be awake and maintain the shield. It's also also not great because Harrier isn't even sure that they're going to be allowed back into the city because he can hear the city panicking behind them and he can hear the Isvani army panicking on the other side of the shield. And that is where we left it. So we're going to recap a couple of chapters here. We're going to try for two. Beginning with chapter 14 of The Phoenix Endangered by Mercedes Lackey and James Mallory. And chapter 14 is titled City Under Siege. Now, chapter 14 begins with Harrier and Tressel trying to get back into the city. And, um... Harrier notes that it's very noisy, like he can't even hear anything, and that's because he can, well, the, the things that he can hear, he can't hear Tercel right next to him, but he can hear the people in the city panicking, he can hear the army out on the other side of the shield, they are now chanting and everything that they can do to express their displeasure. Harrier thinks that it kind of sounds like the worst kind of storm that he had ever heard down at the docks, and the ride back seems very long. 
They get to the gates, and Harrier shouts up to the guard who would let them out to, uh, hey, let us back in. And the guard refuses. In fact, he refuses, and he's like, who are you? Harrier's like, dude, I helped train you. You know who I am. We're the same people that left here an hour ago. And look. Look, we, we put a spell shield around your whole shield city. The, the enemy can't get in. This doesn't seem to impress the guard, whose name is Batho, very much. And the horses are, are being very restive and dancing about. The guard disappears. And Harrier figures it's time to talk to Tercel. Tercel says that he thinks that it would be better if the you know, maybe if they told him why the spell shield was there. Harrier points out quite rightfully that it's very hard to explain anything to a wall, which is the only thing that they see. They stand there for a good chunk of time because now the sky is beginning to lighten, which is a little bit weird because the, the spell shield has its own kind of radiance to it, and it's this giant kind of purplish-pink dome over the entire city. But the dome is getting brighter, and Harrier realizes that um, the maze shield's great. It's totally going to be able to protect them from the army, but uh, they might just end their journey right here. Because if they can't get back into the city, they're going to die of heat stroke. Because obviously the maid shield is not protecting them from the heat of the day. And they can't even get water because all of the water that goes to the outside of the city is controlled by pumps on the inside of the city. He tries to persuade... Tercel to call Anne Keldar. Tercel is about to refuse, but quoting, Just then, there was movement on the top of the wall once again. Harrier looked up. Light defend us, he said softly. Batho was back, and standing with him was the Telchi, Council Adarnus, and someone that Harrier recognized after a few moments of study as the chief light priest of the main temple, Perceptor Laramic. Do you swear by the light that you mean us no harm? Batho shouted. Oh, for the love of... Batho, if Tercel hadn't cast that spell, this damn city would be on fire right now, and you know it, Harrier yelled back. We mean you no harm, Tercel called. I swear it by the light. There was another long pause. The party on the top of the wall retreated. Did you really think yelling at them was going to do any good? Tercel demanded. Oh, sorry. I'm afraid I was thinking about how much fun it was going to be to die outside the gates because they wouldn't let us come back inside after you had saved their city. The boys continue arguing for a few more moments until they they realize that the gates are being opened. That's pretty good. They get ready to ride back in, but no, no, they can't quite get back in because coming out of the gates are a dozen guardsmen, all fully armored and all with their swords drawn. Council Aldarnus, surrounded by his personal guard, a couple more nobles and the Telchi, along with Perceptor Laramic, four sub-Perceptors, and another dozen guards. Harrier thinks to himself, is there anyone left guarding the city? Um, but he also knows that the Telchi must have spoken for him, because that's the only reason he would be here with all of these nobles. The council comes walking up to them and asks, who cast the spell? Tercel's like, it, it was me. The council says that uh, blue robes have always been welcome in the city, but why didn't you let anyone know what you were? Tercel, 
looks over at Harry or looks at the Telchi and then just decides to, I mean, he's going to have to explain it someday, quoting, I'm not a wild mage, Tricell answered. Once, a long time ago, there was another kind of magic called the high magic that those born with something called the mage gift could learn. When I discovered that I had been born with the mage gift, I studied the ancient spell books. There are many books about the high magic in the great library at Aramath. Harrier was impressed. Nothing Tercel had said was a lie, but the statements taken together provided a very different picture than the actual truth. Why have you come here? the council demanded. The magic sent me visions of danger, Tercel said simply. I needed to know where they came from. You know, I imagine, that I've been asking if anyone in the city knows of a lake of fire anywhere in the desert. My vision has shown me this place, but I don't know where it is. The council doesn't really like that answer, but he, I mean, obviously can see that it's at least mostly true because there's a giant spell dome over the city. He does want to know why the magic would pick Tercel because he's just a boy. I mean, isn't there someone he could have gone to? Tercel tells him that it took him a while to learn his spells and he couldn't prove anything to anybody. And even after he had learned his spells, the only thing he could do is prove to people that he had magic. Uh, he lets the man know that the lake of fire must be somewhere in the desert. And he's pretty sure that whatever is in the lake of fire is what has convinced the Isvani to attack him. He does tell him that the spell that he put around the city is called Mage Shield, and he will hold it as long as he can. Harrier thinks that that last bit that Tercel added might be a bit much. He probably could have left that out, but he doesn't have any time to add anything because the council says, fine, if you and your friend over there swear in front of the light priest that you mean no harm, that you swear a sacred oath that you mean no harm to the city, we'll let you back in. Harrier is impressed at, at being asked to swear this oath. This is an oath that is only used by the portmaster when he marries the sea and used in, in marriages between nobles because those cannot be set aside. So this is like the highest, the, the highest oath that you can swear. He also finds it a bit disconcerting to be swearing an oath in the name of the eternal light and the blessed Saint Adalia and Kellen the poor orphan boy that that they mean no harm. He mostly finds that a bit odd to be doing these days since he's actually met the blessed Saint Adalia and it just seems a little bit weird. But it does get them back into the city. They are moved from the Telchi's house to the council's palace, and Harrier wants to know if they're being held prisoner. The council's like, uh, no, no, you're my honored guest, and we want to keep an eye on you. It's a bit much, but the Telchi advises them that it's fine. They can do this. Harrier also notices that everybody's dismissing him, and he could probably announce that he is a wild mage, but uh, that would probably be a really bad idea. Plus, he couldn't actually prove anything because his three books are back at the Telchis. He asked the Telchi if, uh, if maybe he could go back to the house, and the Telchis, no, no, that's not a good idea. The Telchi also says that the city is quite unsettled after this big purple light in the sky, but he will start spreading the word that the, the light in the sky will defend them. 
the council then asks if Tercel could do, uh, you know, a little more, because he has heard that the high mages of old had lots of spells. Tercel is a bit hesitant, and he says, I know what you're thinking. I've read those stories, too. The old high mages slew the and darkened and called down lightning out of the sky. Those aren't spells I know. I'm sorry. If I did know them, I might be able to use them, but I'll try to think of something that'll help. The council reluctantly accepts that. And he leaves and leaves the boys in their room. The Telchi says that he's going to see about bringing all of their things from his house to their new place. And Harrier and Tricell are kind of left to their own devices. They talk a little bit and Harrier's like, Hi, how you feeling? Y you feeling really awake? Tricell just kind of lets that roll off his back. And they also talk about the spells that Tercel knows. Because, you know, Harrier's like, it seems like you and Ann Keldar were practicing a lot of magic and you don't have anything that would work against an army. And Tercel's like, we were practicing, like, shields and, and things, you know, that would be useful against other high mages or elven mages or other folk or you know stuff like that harrier thinks that that was pretty darn useless but it's it is what it is he also wants to know if you know maybe you could try some of the other spells that I, I know you used. He said, didn't you turn a bunch of rocks into water at the Black Rowan farm? Tercel's like, yeah, um, I could turn walls or rocks into water, but that's about it. The Telchi, who's back in the room with them now, asks if transmutation could be used on living flesh. No. Tercel said in horror. Then, no, more quietly. It can't, and even if it could, it would kill them. Sometimes some must die so others may live, the Telchi said. You aren't talking about some, said Harrier. Unless they're all killed, whichever ones aren't dead will just go on with their attacks, so... You're talking about killing almost 5,000 people. There are almost that many in the city, the Telchi said. It seems a choice must be made. Not by me, said Tercel. He got up and strode away. Harrier wasn't sure what to do. Not really. He'd hoped when he had first heard the word army that it would be, well, smaller. If there was one thing he had learned growing up on the docks of Aramath, it was how much a tale grew in the telling. He had hoped to, no matter what size this army was, that it would be something that Tercel could frighten away. Because that had been a good plan, to convince the enemy that Tarnatha Atreyu was someplace that wasn't worth their trouble. He thinks about the fact that now that he's seen and listened to the army, he didn't think it was going to work. And it's also not fair that Tercel should have to make decisions like this because the final decision is going to be Tercel's. And he also thinks that Tercel's right. It's, it's not right just to, like, kill 5,000 people, but the Telchi's right, too. You know, and Harrier kind of wishes that there was some way that they could basically arrest this army and give them a trial, a sentence, the same protection of law that anyone else living in a land ruled by a high magistrate got. But he knows if they aren't killed, that um, they're going to kill everybody in the city. And he doesn't think that they're going to just go away. A little bit later on, 
after all of those wonderful ideas, he also realizes that since this is Harrier, that he's hungry and he goes and orders breakfast. He goes in about 20 minutes later, once the breakfast has been delivered, to let Tercel know that it's there and finds Tercel brooding. Quoting, What? said Tercel. Breakfast is coming, said Harrier. And I figured you were going to explain to me, you know, why you don't want to call up Anne Keldar to come and chase these guys away. It wouldn't work, said Tercel, flopping into a chair. You could try. If Maid Shield didn't scare them off, what in the name of light will? They might scatter for a day or two, but they'll regroup and come back, and they have javelins. I've read about the Ismani. In the desert, they hunt using spears and arrows and a kind of heavy curved sword called Nawarden. They would throw spears. And Keldar has scales? He has wings, too, and if he flies low enough to scare them at all, he flies in javelin range. If his wings are badly damaged, he wouldn't be able to fly. So, really, you're saying there's pretty much no point because he wouldn't scare them. Tressel flashed him a great, grateful smile and turned back to the window. Turk? said Harrier, hating himself. The Telchi wouldn't think of it because he wasn't there at Windy Meadows, but you could cast fire. Tressel says no, and that he won't do it. And then he points out, and it's kind of cruel of you to even ask me to, but uh, for that matter, you can cast it too, because you're a wild mage. Harrier sees the point, you know. Tressel says that he just keeps hearing things screaming and he just can't do it. He's, he's not a warrior. He's barely a mage. Harrier drops the issue and uh, kind of just is like, well, how about you at least look through all your high magic books once they get here and see if there's anything that you can do? After breakfast, the Telchi comes with a whole line of basically what looks like everything that was in Harrier and Tercel's rooms, all boxed up, right down to the garbage. It's um, a lot, but in all of that, is Tercel or is Harrier's three books. Obviously, he's the only one that recognizes them for what they are, but uh, one of the sub-perceptors who was introduced as a, a person who is supposedly to help Tercel, but more just to spy on him, is like, what do you want with these blank notebooks? Harrier is like, I'll just take those and uh, put them away myself. So he's got his three books back. It's just another example of the wild magic watching out for itself. Tercel also kind of tangles with the Perceptor of the Light, Perceptor Laramic, because Perceptor Laramic's like, uh, you, you boys... And Tercel, I don't think he's tired yet, but I think he's had enough. He is definitely fed up. And he lets the Perceptor know that he is properly Lord Tercel. This shocks Harrier because he's never heard Tercel using his title, but he kind of understands why because they're dealing with a bunch of people to whom rank and nobility mean a whole lot, and it's going to be easier if they aren't constantly being looked down on for their age. They do make kind of friends with the sub-perceptors, the 
basically acolytes who were there to watch them. And mostly that's because they're about the same age and it's all good. Now, Harry and Tercel are getting ready. It's getting towards night by this point and <laughs> Harry is thinking about bed and Tercel is thinking about getting some cafe. -a. I do think it's funny, side note, that pretty much, I don't think in Tolkien, but in pretty much everywhere else, you can tell that maybe authors are really into coffee because it ends up in every fictional universe I can think of. Whether they call it cafea or cav or coffee, I, it feels like it's everywhere. And that does make me kind of smile. Also, and I can't remember where in these books it is, but they describe how it's brewed and it almost makes me think that it's probably like that. I think it's Turkish coffee that's brewed in sand. Never tried that, but it's supposed to be really good. I like coffee, or at least I should say I like creamer with a little coffee in it. Anyway, they they go through and they have their first day and it's kind of funny. Harrier is trying to ease his mind and he actually takes some time to look through his books. And it keeps reminding him how different wild magic and the high magic seems to be. You know, and it also keeps reminding him that he just doesn't know very much about magic at all and how much he wishes that he had somebody he could ask. He does know that the wild magic was good, but what was good wasn't always kind. You could be kind and not be good, and you could be good and not be kind. And Harrier is still thinking that Although he knows that the wild magic is good, he's afraid to take that final step and really embrace it. He reads through the Book of the Stars, which is the most esoteric of them, and begins feeling a little bit better when finally Tercel shows up. <laughs> and Tercel comes in and says, We have a bookcase. That's nice said Harrier. There's nothing I like better when my city is besieged by crazy people than a nice bookcase. Tercel frowned. Are you drunk? No, I've been reading. Oh, that explains it, said Tercel. Dasbuk and Rael have gone back to the temple for liturgy. They'll be back tomorrow. And I had a chance to check a couple of my spell books. You won't like what I found, or maybe you will, I don't know. You sound funny, said Harrier. So do you, said Tercel. Are you sure you haven't been drinking? There's no wine in here. What won't I like? I'd forgotten some things about Maid Shield. It's a shield, you know? Probably why they call it a Maid Shield here. No, said Tercel seriously. If it was just that, they'd call it, I don't know, shield or something. It's made shield specifically. I mean, it keeps out spears and arrows and people, and that's good, but it won't let magic through either. He looked at Harrier, as if Harrier should understand what that meant, and Harrier didn't, but he knew it was obvious. Spells can't pass through it, Harrier, said Tercel. Not in and not out. Oh, said Harrier. So, so it doesn't matter what spells I find in the spell books, I'd have to dispel Mage Shield to cast it. The walls would stop the army. Tercel shrugged for a little while. Before bed that night, the Telchi comes in and lets them know that from what he can see up on the walls, through Maid Shield, of course, 
the enemy army is actually in pretty bad shape. And that's kind of a good thing. Harrier wants to know how bad of shape, and the Telchi says that he's watched them for most of a day. They have not encircled the city. They, they've they pitched their tents out in the orchards, and it's obvious that they are hungry and thirsty. The uh, implication being that they're pretty dang desperate. Like, if we remember back in the last chapter with the Isvani themselves, they pretty much need to get to the city just to resupply the army. So they're they're in pretty bad shape. And as the Telchi points out, there's no water outside the city. Tercel asks how long they could survive without water. And the Telchi says maybe a sun night. If they slaughter their beasts and drink their blood for survival, they could survive even longer. But if they get rid of their showtars, they wouldn't be able to go across the desert on foot, so they aren't going to want to do that. And between the three of them, they come up with the outline of a plan. And the plan is to make the Isvani, who are outside of the walls, think that the city, that the maid shield is going to fail quickly so that they don't kill their Shotars, or, yeah, so that they don't, and so that they, they give their Shotars the water instead of drinking themselves, thus weakening themselves, and then in a couple of days, everybody from the city can just go out and uh, deal with the army. So the, the guts of the plan is that Probably the next day, Tercel is going to bring the maid shield down and then put it up like it's just in time. And they'll keep doing that periodically, making the army think that they might have a chance until they've completely weakened themselves or until Tercel passes out from exhaustion and then the, the city defenders should be able to just sweep on out and kill the the Isvani army with no problems at all. Now we know the best laid plans of mice and men definitely usually go awry. So we're going to be moving on and recapping chapter 15 after I get a drink. All right, so Recapping Chapter 15 of The Phoenix Endangered by Mercedes Lackey and James Mallory. Chapter 15 is titled The Long Watch. Chapter 15 begins with Harrier waking up at his usual hour and going out and seeing Tercel with a pot of café. And Tercel lets him know that he, he he's decided he hates café. But... Uh, He's, he's yawning a lot, but he's not exhausted yet. Side note, you make me stay up for 24 hours straight, and uh, I'm going to be pretty, pretty um, cranky. I think the longest I've ever stayed up straight is like maybe 36 hours, and I was utterly loopy by the end of it. So I don't know how well I would do if I had to hold a maid shield above a city for who knows how long. But back to the book, the boys go in along with the Telchi and their sub-preceptors who are keeping an eye on them to see the chief magistrate and the council and all of the council's personal guards and everybody, and they're going to present their idea to the council. The council kind of doesn't take it really well. He doesn't seem to like Tercel. He definitely doesn't like Harrier, who he's decided must be Tercel's manservant. Harrier's not going to dissuade him from that, but Tercel goes on and explains his plan in great detail. The council reluctantly decides that that is probably about the best bet and then tells them, okay, 
well, I'll tell everybody in the city that this is the plan so that they don't panic when the, the shield comes down. That's when Harrier decides that he must speak up. Quoting, No, Harrier said. The council stared at him in surprise. Sir, think, if it were really happening, if the shield really failed, what would people do? He hadn't meant to say anything. He hadn't really wanted the council's attention at all. He had to speak up to help Tercel explain the plan, but he certainly hadn't expected to do what amounted to arguing with the council. Only he knew this was important. He hadn't even thought about it until the council said that he was going to announce to the people that Tercel would take down the mage shield and it was nothing for them to worry about. But the minute the man had, Harrier had realized that the whole plan was based on tricking the Isvani army into believing that the shield was failing. They would panic, the council said slowly. They know now that the mage shield is their defense. Then that's what the army would expect to hear, said Harrier. Panic. So they'll need to hear panic. There will be injuries, said the council. Damage to the city? I'm sorry, said Harrier. If the Isvani think it's a trick, though. Yes, I thank the light you were sent to me, both of you. It shall be done as you have said. Now, perhaps, would be the best. There will be less people in the streets now. So, Tercel and Harrier walk up go out to the city walls, go all the way up onto the wall, and Tercel brings down the maid shield. Harrier lets the guards up there know it's okay, it's okay, even though he can hear people in the city panicking behind them. But more importantly, the trick seems to be working. Quoting, The Isvani saw that the shield was down. The sound of their distant shouting began to reach Harrier's ears, and then it was drowned out by the sounds of the people in the city behind him. The noise built slowly, shouts and screams and scraps of sentences, demands for information, the crash of something falling, the sounds of people shouting at each other until their voices blended into a blur of sound that simply rose in volume. Five minutes passed and ten, and slowly the distant noise from the Isvani army increased until it could be heard over the noise from the city as the Isvani stumbled from their tents and saddled their shotars and began moving towards the city in a vast wave. Don't you think, said Harrier. Wait, said Tressel. The ground shook as the shotars galloped forward and the Isvani howled in fury a bone-chilling sound. The army raced closer to the walls and closer sill and showed no signs of stopping at all. Then Tercel gestured, spreading both hands as if he were in the middle of an argument with Harrier and making a point, and the wall of made shield fire sprang into place once more, only scant feet away from the noses of the lead shotars. The Isvani had no warning. The first ranks of the army slammed into the barrier at full speed. The riders were flung from their backs with the impact falling beneath the feet of the animals behind them. Might defend them, said Tercel quietly. The outer edges of the army, seeing the dan danger, desperately tried to rein in or turn aside. A few of them could only to find themselves jammed against the barrier farther down by other riders who were also desperately trying to escape the carnage. More of the Isvani army was swept into a collision with the maid shield by the momentum of the riders behind them, and the center of the column had no place to go. Riders plowed into each other, crushing the ones ahead of them against the barrier. The men on the walls cheered at the sight, which does not actually make Tercel or Harrier happy. As I said in the last chapter, Tercel is not a warrior, and realizing that he just killed who knows how many people 
makes him sick. It's, it's not cool, and even Harrier is kind of taken aback at just how effective that tactic was. Tercel also lets him know that he can't do that again. Harrier's like, uh, you kind of got to, though. And Tercel says, no, not the maid shield thing. I can't do that walk again. I'm exhausted. And the Telchi's like, don't worry. We'll put a spotter up and we'll just do relays. And that way you'll know when to put the shields up and down and everything like that. Later on that day, they go back. And that's kind of how the days go. It's now been four days, and Tercel has been putting up the shield and taking down the shield and getting more and more exhausted. By the fourth day, Tercel didn't bother searching through his books any longer. I can't concentrate, he said. His voice was slurred. He was never left alone now. Harrier, the Telchi, Haspic, or Rael, or somebody else was always with him to help him stay awake. The Telchi said that by now the Isvani were undoubtedly quite weak. He also said that they certainly wished to seem weaker than they were, so that Tercel must hold out as long as he could, and he had to do it by will alone, and whatever help Kafea could give him. The city healers had drugs to bring sleep, and drugs that would also banish it, but too little or too much of either would have the opposite effect, and an overdose of either would kill. They didn't dare take a chance. Harrier also realizes that after four days with no sleep, Tercel's running a fever. Again, after... 36 hours with no sleep. I think I was running a fever, so I cannot even imagine. But yeah, Tricelle is running on fumes at this point. They keep on going and keep on going. It's now been about five or six days that Tricelle has been with no sleep. And I think it's, yeah, about the sixth day. Harrier is like, all right, Tur, ter, drop the shield. Tercel just is like, okay. And the shield vanished. And Harrier's like, okay, put it back up. And he has to shake Tercel quite hard to get him to recast the shield. And when he shakes Tercel very hard to recast the shield, Tercel hallucinates maybe? We'll, we'll call it a hallucination for now. Did you see him? said Tercel, sounding frantic. He jerked himself free of Harrier's grasp and stumbled away. The man, the one that we saw in Stereoporin, the one I saw on the plains, the one that couldn't see you, he's here. There was so much conviction in Tercel's voice that Harrier actually looked around, but there was no one around but them. No, said Harrier. No, Tercel, I didn't see him. He's here, said Tercel. I don't know how he got into the city, but he did. He's been following us ever since we left the Veiled Lands. He didn't want to come near me while Anne Keldar was here, but he came back. Tercel, or Harrier, is pretty, pretty much convinced that Tercel's definitely hallucinating at this point. And so he decides that, at this point, he, he's just going to stay with Tercel. No more training anybody, no more leaving Tercel with the Telchi or anybody else. He's keeping an eye on his best friend. He also tries to get Tercel to call Anne Keldar now, and Tercel gets into a big shouting argument about not doing it. The Telchi's like, look, he he's very sleepy harrier just agree with everything that he says he also tercel is still insisting that he saw the red man the the mage or whatever it was that they've seen now a couple of different times 
Harrier describes the creature, man, whatever, to the Telchi, and the Telchi's like, I think anybody that's like seven feet tall, all dressed in red with red hair, would be remarked on in the city, but I'll ask around. And the days keep going. On the sixth or seventh day, the maid shield is now flickering, but it's flickering outside of Tercel's control. He's basically just doing little micro sleeps at this point. And they basically are just concentrating on keeping Tercel awake. It's now just become a race between Tercel's body giving out and the Isvani getting weaker and their plan actually working. Harrier lets the Telchi know that it's it's going to be soon. He doesn't think that that Tricel can hold out for much longer. And for the whole of that day, Harrier felt as if he was in a race, a slow, terrible, nightmarish race where the consequences of losing was too terrible to imagine. Tricel no longer dared even sit down for fear of falling asleep. He leaned against the walls, blotting his face and neck with towels dri dipped in ice water, moving from place to place to try to stay awake. The spell kept flickering, gone and back so swiftly if Harrier hadn't been watching for it, half sick with knowing what the instability represented, he wouldn't have noticed what was happening. It would have been a beautiful job of pretending the shield was about to fall at any moment if Tercel had been pretending. That evening, Harrier takes Tercel up onto the roof at Tercel's insistence, and Tercel is still worried about the, the red man. Harrier's like, Tercel, he can't get you up here, obviously. And Tercel says, he doesn't have to in that frighteningly calm voice. Tricell took a step towards the edge of the roof again, swaying as he did. He's crowned in fire. We're all gonna burn, I... Harrier never found out what Tricell's next words might have been because his eyes rolled in his head and his knees buckled and he fell forward. And the maid shield above them vanished. Harrier tells the guards to sound the alarms because it's time. It's, it's for real this time. And he takes Tercel off to find him someplace to just let him lay down and ride this out. Because if the plan goes to plan, then all of the warriors in the city, or all of the guards in the city, will go out, deal with the army, yay, and then everything will be great. So Harrier picks up Tercel, takes him into a room, decides just to be safe to block the door with a table, and he just kind of sits to watch his friend. After a couple of hours of not hearing anything, he realizes that they messed up and that the army obviously was not as weak as they were thinking. And that the reason he isn't hearing fighting is because there was an ambush planned against the ambush. At least that's what he thinks it is. And that if he's going to have any chance at all, he's got to find out what's going on. And so the chapter ends with Harrier unbolting the door and moving out carrying Tercel, who is completely passed out still. So, yeah, I like these two chapters, especially because, like I said, I can't tell you how many times I have read those chapters and winced in sympathy because, yeah, I think 36 hours approximately was as long as I've ever been able to stay awake and I was probably hallucinating by the end of about 20 hours. I like sleep.
I don't get nearly enough like good unbroken sleep, but I really like sleep and um yeah, I feel for Tercel. Coffee does not work after the first little bit. In fact, coffee doesn't work for me at all. I'm one of those weirdos that can drink an entire pot of coffee and then go take a nap. I think caffeine just works the opposite way in me. Or maybe I'm just so desensitized to it, but yeah. Anyway, we are actually really close to the end of this book. I haven't decided after we finish this trilogy if I'm going to keep doing like book reviews and recaps, but we are definitely finishing this series. And then we'll just sit back and see what everybody thinks. I don't feel like I'm the best recapper in the world, but maybe I can keep improving at it. Anyway, thank you for listening. I hope that you enjoyed the recap, and I will see you later.